Zion Lutheran Church of Wilton, Iowa, invite you to worship with them. We are your neighbors and friends in Christ.
A warrior is not delivered by his great strength.
The Old Testament reading for this, the first Sunday after Trinity, is from Genesis chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 1 John, chapter 4. So we have now come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may pass from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that, they, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. 
Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. We'll have our children come forward for the children's message. Morning. Did you listen carefully to the gospel reading just a moment ago where Jesus told this parable? A parable is a story that Jesus tells us to show us what heaven is like. Well, what did you think about that story? Do you think that the rich man went to Hades and torment because he was rich? Or do you think Lazarus went to be at Abraham's side in heaven because he was suffering and poor? That's what it sounds like, doesn't it? But that isn't the case. Being rich isn't a sin. Being poor isn't great. Being, and being a sufferer doesn't mean, well, you've earned your way into heaven because you suffer. No, there's something else going on there. There's a name in that parable. What was the name of the poor man that was suffering? Lazarus, yeah. You know what that means, that name? God is my help. Now, when we look at that parable, and hear it again, we can understand what it's all about. Why are we saved? Because of something we do? Hmm? Because we suffer a lot? Because we're pretty good? Keep the commandments? Why are you saved? Because of God, right. And what did God do for us? Sent his son to die on the cross for us, right? Yeah, to take away our sins. Where is our help then? Is it in us? Or in somebody else there? No. Our help is in God, that's right. And what he has done for us. God has loved us, and died for us, and called us into his kingdom by washing us in holy baptism and making us one of his own children. And as one of God's children, we get all of God's kingdom. Everything, all the great things. The most important to start off is forgiveness, right? God forgives us our sins and makes us his child and gives us heaven so that we, when we suffer, even when we die, we aren't lost, are we? No. Our Lord takes us to be with him forever in heaven. He's promised it. He rose from the dead to make sure that we knew we will rise from the dead. Isn't that great? Yeah. So we're not to be trusting in how much money we have or property or how great we are. And we're not to 
rejoice and say, see, I'm suffering, so I'm going to get to heaven. None of that's right. That doesn't matter. What matters is, who do we trust in for our being saved? God. That's right. God is our help, right? We're a Lazarus, aren't we? Yeah. All right, you can go back to your moms and dads. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name, that I may walk in your truth. to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If we were asked to list our problems, you know, the things that are wrong, out of sorts, difficult in our life, what would that list look like? A lack of funds to pay the bills or to do the things that we want to do would probably be on there. Or perhaps health issues, a chronic illness or pain or injury stress at work, the problems of raising a family, a house that needs painted, dealing with friends, potholes in the roads, weeds in the garden, moles in the lawn, a kitchen that never seems to stay clean. Yes, the cares of this world are many. And our list, no doubt, would be pretty long. We are no doubt daily tempted to focus on these problems. The things we see with our eyes. The things that the, the world tells us we should be worried about. But we should repent of that. Because these are not really our problems. And that's the message that Jesus gives us today in this parable. The things we see with our eyes can't be trusted. And the appearances of this world lie to us. What appear to be the problems of this rich man and Lazarus are not their real problems. And what appear to be their strengths are not their real strengths. For example, the problem of the rich man is not that he is rich. We may be tempted to think that. That the point of the parable is that people who have it easy on this earth will get it hard in Hades. And that those who, like Lazarus, suffer on earth earn a spot in heaven because of their suffering. Hardly. God owes us nothing. He is the creator. We are the creatures. There is no way we could ever be in debt. He could be in debt to us. We can buy his favor with our hardships as little as we can buy it with our money. No, the rich man's problem is not that he's rich. Jesus makes that pretty clear by saying that Lazarus, when he died, 
rested with Saint Abraham while he waited for the resurrection. You see, Abraham was a very, very rich man. He was indeed the ruler of a small kingdom. Once was able to summon 318 of his men to, on a military expedition in order to save his nephew Lot. He had flocks and herds past counting. And he had no wants. It was within his power to be clothed in purple every day and eat and feast sumptuously. And he's not condemned for it. There he is at rest and peace waiting for the resurrection. And since Abraham is not condemned for his riches, neither is the rich man in the parable condemned for his riches. Nor has Lazarus earned God's blessing because of his suffering. You know, many, many others have suffered more than Lazarus did and ended up in Hades in torment. For example, in the book of Acts, we read of King Herod Agrippa. He suffered horribly from an intestinal disease and was consumed from the inside out by worms. But this suffering, just as wretched as Lazarus's, didn't earn Herod a place next to Abraham's side. So all the rich are not condemned, and all the poor and suffering are not saved. So what's the point of this parable? Why is the rich man condemned and Lazarus saved? And for that, we must look a little more deeply into this parable and notice one detail that occurs nowhere else in the parables of our Lord. A name. In all the other parables of Jesus, he speaks of a certain young man, a certain merchant, a man, a sower. But this parable is different. One of the characters in this parable has a name, Lazarus. And the name Lazarus means, God is my help. That's the key. That's the meaning of the parable. Lazarus isn't saved because he suffers, but because God has given him faith through his word, and he clings to God as his only help. The rich man isn't condemned because he's rich, but because the rich man trusts in himself and his riches more than he trusts in God. That's what puts Abraham and Lazarus on one side and the rich man in the parable on the other. Abraham is the father of faith. As we heard in our Old Testament reading for today, he believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. So also Lazarus found that in his faith in God, he had more true riches than that supposedly rich man who actually had nothing at all that would last. Because purple clothes and fine linens will one day fall apart and rot. Sumptuous food is there just for a moment. The mansions of the rich will one day crumble into dust. Indeed, we ourselves will one day die and be gathered up to our fathers. So learn well the lesson of Lazarus 
We have only one help, only one hope, and that is our Lord God. Just look at what our Lord has done for us. He became more poor and wretched and lonely than Lazarus. He came to his own people and they knew him not. They rejected him. They passed him by, shaking their heads as he lay outside of the gates, city gates with a cross on his back. While foxes have holes and birds have nests and rich men have houses, Jesus had no place to lay his head. When he was arrested and beaten and sore injuries covered his body from a thorn-pressed head to a nail-pierced feet, there was no one to comfort him, no one there to heal him, no one even to give a drop of water when he cried out from the cross, I thirst. And all this suffering and dying on the part of Jesus is for us to fill up the punishment of our sins. It's our only help and hope. So give up on the things of this world and trust in Him alone. For dear Christian, what riches can give you the things that Christ has given you? Even if we are as rich as the rich man in the parable, even as if our wealth supersedes all the kings of the world, it's still fleeting. It lasts only a moment. So don't put your trust in riches. And don't put your fear in poverty either. For as this parable shows, riches or poverty simply don't matter. What matters is where we put our trust. To fear poverty is really the same thing as to love riches. It's to trust the things of this life and in this world for our safety and security. But give up on that. There's no safety or security in riches or in good health or in any earthly blessing. There's nothing really to fear from poverty or even suffering. Our only salvation, our only security, is in Christ. If we have Him, we have it all. He cares for His children, and He will not leave us desolate. Jesus said, Behold the lilies of the field, even rich King Solomon in all His glory was not clothed as one of these. And think on the birds of the air. They do not reap or sow, and yet your Father in heaven cares for them. And look at poor Lazarus, suffering and alone. Yet not alone, for God is his help. Don't let your eyes deceive you. Lazarus is richer than the rich man because he has Jesus and the salvation Jesus provides for him through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. And so all these things will be added unto Lazarus in this life or the next. And so also you, dear Christian. We too have the riches of Lazarus. For the one prophesied about in Moses and the prophet, the one who did rise from the dead, Jesus Christ has washed up 
us up in holy baptism and made us his own child. We now wear a robe that is finer than any clothes the rich may try to buy with their wealth. For we wear the robe of Christ's righteousness. We are washed whiter than snow in the crimson blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we feast sumptuously at a banquet far better than even the finest restaurant can produce. For we are invited to the table of the Lord, where the Lord Jesus serves us his very body and blood, given and shed for the forgiveness of all our sins. We are thus filled with food that doesn't just give us strength for our earthly bodies, but for eternal life. In Christ, therefore, we have riches beyond compare. In this way, God is our help, our only help. And our fate is thus the same as that of Lazarus. To be carried by the angels to Abraham's side to await the resurrection of our bodies for life everlasting. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us arise and sing our, uh, we'll introduce the canticle and sing our canticle hymn.
We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Amen. O God, the strength of all who trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers, and because through the weakness of our mortal nature we can do no good thing, grant us your grace to keep your commandments that we may please you in both will and deed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. God, our Father in heaven, look with mercy on us, your needy children on earth, and grant us grace that your holy name would be hallowed by us and all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word and the fervent love shown forth in our lives. Bless our vacation Bible school that we may faithfully proclaim the gospel to all the children attending. Graciously, graciously turn from us all false doctrine and evil living, whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. And may your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your son, by faith, that the number of Christians may be increased. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, Amen. Holy Spirit, eternally proceeding from Father and Son, enlighten with your divine wisdom all who will serve as electors in our synod in the coming days. Grant that they may vote their consciences with honesty and integrity, and that through this election your divine will may be done, the Savior glorified, and his church built up to the glory of God the Father through Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, strengthen us by your spirit according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands we commend all who are in need, especially Keith, Janet, Roberta, Carrie Ann, Shirley, Matthew, Verna, John, Pastor Arndt, Velma, Melanie, Andy, and Hazel. Praying for them at all times, thy will be done. We also ask that through your holy word, you would bring comfort to the family of Curtis Mormon, whose sister was called to her eternal home. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Gracious Lord, grant us our daily bread, preserve us from greed and selfish cares, and help us trust in you to provide for all our needs. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us, so that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Through Christ our Lord we pray, amen. Almighty God, lead us not into temptation, 
but help us by your spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. And lastly, O Father, deliver us from all evil of both body and soul, now and forever, through Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Good morning once again to all of you. Uh, just a couple of reminders uh, to read the bulletin. The, the Board of Ed is gearing up for their uh, big pie sale on uh, harvest uh, days, or not harvest, the founders days. And uh, so there's a sign up sheet in the, in the back to uh, help them out with that. Also, um, our vacation Bible school begins tomorrow. Keep it in your prayers each and every day. Uh, that we teach God's word to the children that are coming and that it may impact their lives uh, for eternity. Uh, we thank you for all the ones who have uh, signed up for volunteer. and It looks really good and promising. Um, also, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be receiving what we call the national offering. Uh, this is done every three years. Uh, at the time of our synodical convention, and then the monies are designated for specific things. Over the next three years, this national joy to the world offering will witness to new immigrants, college students, missionaries of our partner churches, build new churches both here and abroad, and more.
contents and views expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this cable company or its commission.